So hello everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to see some faces I know and some new faces and I, I have heard the nice chatter that we have some people who have traveled from, uh, from near and from far. So it's great that we've gotten East and West Coast representation for this fantastic, uh, certainly travel worthy novel. And Chris, it is fantastic to see you. Hello, old friend. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, this is actually a very special moment for me um, because, as Sarah and Linda alluded to uh, previously, Chris was here a few years ago to talk about Metropolitan Stories, and we had a really great conversation then, and so we're getting the band back together. We're Indeed. here at the Hudson River. <laughs> Our two-woman show. <laughs> Our two-woman show. Um, and so I, I absolutely loved Metropolitan Stories, and of course part of it was because... Um, uh, it, it unearthed so many of those wonderful ideas that had been, uh, I guess, hidden in the nooks and crannies of, of a place like the Metropolitan. Um, and so you've done it again. Um, this time you've drawn a story out. And I know this is an idea that was that was percolating in your mind for, for a long time. So it's very exciting to see it actually in a book. I have a well-worn uh, uh, dog-eared copy. Um, I think I'd like to start, Chris, by tackling the, uh, almost like the elephant in the room, the museum wall label. Yeah. Okay, so I bet everybody here has, when you've entered a museum, you have encountered not only the, the work you came to see or the unexpected surprise, but you encountered a moment of interpretation, um, and that is the museum wall label. And they're different. Uh, they, well, actually, they're the same in many cases. Uh, <laughs> there's something that is consistent about a museum wall label, and actually, it's very interesting in our industry because it had been changing over time to address the, uh, the evolving requests and needs of our audiences. But I'm going to turn it to you for a moment and ask you about, let's talk wall label. Let's talk wall let's label. Talk wall label. <laughs> and, and, and how <laughs> you would make them into a novel. Um, yeah, because it's a, a notoriously boring form. Yeah. <laughs> so to start with... <laughs> You know, the raw materials of, um, you know, and has that institutional voice, that like authoritative, yes. detached institutional voice. Um, it, in, at the Met, when I was writing wall labels, um, it has very strict 75 word limit. Mm -hmm. So um, you're working with such constraint. Um, but I like that because every word has to work. There's no... There's no throwaway line. There's no throwaway phrase. Everything has to sing. And in a good label, and I think we've all experienced a lot of bad labels, but a good label really sticks the landing. So that 75 words gives you something to take away. Um, and I think the really great labels drive looking back to the object. And so some, one of the things that I really wanted to do is forget about label as explanation and create sort of label as catalyst. So if you think about our usual patterns, we look at a work of art, then we read the label. And we usually spend more time with the label than we do with the work of art. I wanted to reverse that dynamic and just give you the label and every page looks like this. I mean, there are as many blank pages in this book as there are written ones. Um, but my idea in doing that was I'm going to describe this thing, and you're going to make it. You're going to conjure it. Use your imagination. Make the reader kind of complicit in this. And we do that all the time when we read. I mean, if you read a, a scene about a battle or a dinner party, you're making that as you read. But I wanted to almost formalize that relationship and create this kind of wall with a missing work of art that you are then going to conjure um, based on my description. So can we start? Why don't we just kick it off? I know. I think you have I to. Think, I have to read one so you actually let's, understand let's how is this off. even possible. And I want. And I, again, I think everybody here is familiar with that wall label format. So get ready, listen. <laughs> well, well, and, and that's important see. because the first three lines you're going to hear me read are what we call in museums the tombstone information, mm -hmm. which is the artist and the dates and the medium and all of that. I've appropriated that form and the regularity of that form so that on every wall label, you're getting information to drive the story. I mean, at the end of the day, I liked this idea of writing labels about people, but I'm also writing a novel. So I have to do all the hard work of a traditional novel. You need plot, you need character development, 
You need emotional attachment to these characters. So that work could be done because that tombstone provides a lot of really fundamental information to drive that plot and keep things moving. Mm -hmm. So we will watch how that morphs throughout this book. This is an early label. Manhattan Child, age 6, 1912. Caroline Margaret Brooks Whitaker, known as Kitty. Collection of Martha and Harrison Whitaker. Kitty and the related examples in her garniture follow the precedent of earlier forms, ignoring the avant-garde of contemporary European movements like Cubism in deference to careful restraint and balanced presentation. Like many society standards of similar manufacture, Kitty's smooth surfaces and refined proportions borrow from the 18th century example of Robert Adams' neoclassical designs. In a small Rococo flourish, Kitty likes to steal things. <laughs> we'll get to that later. Um, there are some persistent themes. And we should also, there's only one art word that I define in this whole book that's riddled with art terms, which is garniture. Mm -hmm. um, and I put that right up front um, as a definition because um, in talking to my colleagues at the Met, um, including some very senior curators, um, almost everyone outside of the European decorative arts world thought I was talking about parsley. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea of a garniture is a set of porcelain, kind of matching porcelain, like you've seen them on mantelpieces and things. And so this, well, kind of, that's sort of a garniture. So the idea of, of Kitty, who I use the language of porcelain to describe her because she has this kind of porcelain life, um, and her friends are this garniture, and they all feel like they're at the center of the garniture, each one of them. So there's also this awareness of their competition with one another. Um, and so I felt like that was such a fundamental construct that I was creating that I had to define that one. But the rest of them, you're on your own, just like in a museum where we never define the words we use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's, um, yes, for better or for worse, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, okay, so now we're, right, we're all the, literally on the same page here. Garniture, we've got it. Not parsley. Okay. <laughs> so, oh, can you take us through one more to get us? We, you've okay, intro, well, you've introed um, us, and where would you like to take us? Now I'm going to take you to the garniture. Okay. They're a fun bunch, but... Um, <laughs> Rival, age seven, 1913. Caroline Margaret Brooks Whitaker, known as Kitty. Collection of Martha and Harrison Whitaker. An awareness of curatorial hierarchy arrives early in Kitty, as, as Kitty recognizes the limited real estate of any prized pedestal. Critical distinctions are being made, judgments imposed, and rankings adjusted by a collective force that Kitty feels but does not quite understand. Her fellow garniture members all bear the weight of this competition from a young age, the sense of being evaluated to, de to determine who will be the most treasured object among them. So I think that idea of these young women at such an early age recognizing the gaze and that sense of being evaluated and eventually um, collected, um, in the, I mean, it made this uh, this language so easy to apply and kind of thrilling to apply to a, a to a life um, because the constraint I call it Kitty's vitrine um, that the constraint of that vitrine is so baked into the societal pressure and confines that she's put in. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, members of uh, the garniture are not all, uh, don't all play fair. <laughs> they don't play fair. Um, well, I think we, we get introduced to the garniture individually when Kitty gets married, and they're all bridesmaids, naturally. Um, and so we can read um, one of the lovely, where is she? As, as Chris looks for this page, one thing that I thought was fascinating is, just like a label, this book has no page numbers. I fought for no page numbers because there are not page numbers on labels. Um, so you got to read it in one sitting or you'll lose your place. Okay, here's, a, here's a, a garniture member. Melissa Kilman Coddington Crane, known as Sissy. 
Bridesmaid No. 1, age 19, 1926. Collection of Clarissa and Buford Crane, known as Clara and Biff, on loan. A member of Kitty's original garniture, Sissy engages in the unfamiliar work of standing as accessory to Kitty's center centerpiece. She has long considered Kitty of inferior provenance, despite their equally balanced proportions and related manufacture. Their former re formal relationship is one of obligation, ornamented with competition and a hint of unsettled history. They reunite for this exhibition, but Sissy secretly longs to elbow Kitty off the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> So one, the, one of the great constructs of writing labels is, and I think this is an interesting thing that has to do with the, the museum practice of labels. When you write a label, and I was um, doing something very unusual, which was writing labels for curators. Most of the time, curators write their own labels. Um, we were working on a very big project that involved seven different curators. And the curator in charge really wanted the galleries themselves to have a single voice. And so I was going to be that voice. And I was a former speech writer, so I was going to treat it like writing a speech. So I was representing the voice of the galleries. And I would sit with each curator. And every single object, we would talk about what story we were going to tell. Um, and that's an important distinction about labels, because labels are mostly about leaving things out. You only get 75 words. And so I'm talking to the people who know everything about an object, everything there is to know, and I'm asking them to leave most of it out. They do that all the time, but that idea of what story you're actually going to put in and what you're going to leave out became very important in this book as well. And so when we are talking about a silver teapot in the British galleries, we could talk about a lot of things. We could talk about the maker, the owner, silver in the 18th century, tea in the slave trade, middle class consumption, but you can't talk about all those things. You can only talk about one of them. And so I like that idea of constructing a life using these glimpses that capture moments throughout her trajectory. But I wanted the reader to also start to understand that they weren't getting the whole story. Right. And so that dynamic, and I think there's great energy in that, because again, it's activating the reader to think about that. Um, and when we talk about it, you know, how these labels, this curator, who is me writing this book, has picked a point of view, and I wanted to almost undermine that idea as you were reading and as it was unfolding. And you, one of the ways that you help us fill in the blanks, because we know there are a lot of machinations going on, in, these, in the family dynamics behind the scene. Uh, like all of us, Kitty did not choose the, where she was born and to whom she was born. So there's a whole behind the scenes, and I think it's very compelling that she, is the, she starts off as the collection of, right? Yeah. Um, you also have a, a, what I thought was a really brilliant way of bringing additional context to the story. There are different breaks through the book where other voices come in, and we hear from we hear something that's not on a label. Yeah. Can so there are, about what there are little there? moments where um, dialogue pops up, and I wanted that. I wanted it to be kind of shocking when it happened. But I also had that idea of you're standing in the gallery, you're looking at an object, you're reading that wall label, and there's always those people behind you who've got <laughs> all kinds of opinions, and yeah. they're kind of try, they, I, we call them the chatter because of that. So yeah. that idea of like in gallery chatter happening that often contradicts what you're reading. So you've got what you're seeing, what you're reading, what they're saying, and somewhere within that cocktail is something that's probably accurate. But you have to parse that out yourself. So those bits of dialogue, it was a way of giving Kitty a voice, but it was also a way of kind of undermining the authority of the label mm -hmm. itself mm -hmm. and so, creating yeah. that energy. So do you, would you be open to reading one of those interstitial places? What should we read there? Wow. I have to laugh because when you once you get this book, you're going to just. I hope you will embrace the wild ride of names that are going on throughout this book. Yeah, well, that, that well, that's really... part of it too. I love the, um, I love those crazy names, and I love the idea that um, people keep the name that they had when they were like four years old, right. and so it's a tribal thing, though. I mean, that's the thing that it it makes you 
um, easily identify who kind of belongs in your tribe. So if you're like Winthrop to the world, but people who know you, really know you, um, call you Ham, well then, <laughs> <laughs> then you just, you know, like you're one of us. And I just thought, oh my gosh, this is so much fun to like take that idea and that challenge on of all those names. And it gets farcical, but... Um, no, and you know, in a very practical, modern-day concept, it's, you would immediately know who's spam and who really knows you on a phone call. <laughs> so, yeah, right. I mean, it's so sort of that thing. I mean, well, there's a lot of modern about even yeah. the structure of this book, I think. If you think about, like, Instagram mm -hmm. and how we do our storytelling through Instagram and what we show people and what we leave out and sort of the shiny bits are there, but that idea of... A, and, and there's a lot of cubism in this book, and I think it's an almost cubist approach to storytelling where it's like the part has to stand in for the whole and there's this kind of flattening of space and time and then we're going to give you these hints that you know there's the bottle on the table and there's the newspaper or whatever but you're not actually getting the whole thing and I wanted that idea of, of cubism and that form to not only be used as a kind of artistic element throughout the book. Um, Kitty has a thing for Brock and Picasso and that gets taken very far, yes. um, but I think that the idea of that fragmented um, narrative was really important. Mm -hmm. I'm, trying to find you a, um, like? I'm trying to find you. I'm trying to, well. Or maybe perhaps a conversation. Oh, yeah. Right. I know. I know. It's so hard to do it without giving away the plot. <laughs> so th we didn't plan this part, but um, uh. it is <clears throat> tricky um, because those labels are, I mean, those Things are difficult. Anyway, I'm going to skip to... Can I, can, um, can I just do one line? Yeah, and I go ahead. Do, but I love I this. Like this. This is an example of, to me, of providing extra context in those conversations. And Kitty's not pretty to these con these these conversations. So she's, Unless she's... Often it's her voice, though. Oh, yeah. yeah she's okay, got her yes, own. Yes. Yeah. But even just this one line, because I don't want to give things away. I'm very careful about not giving away yeah. authors' uh, surprises. But, well, we've done it, darling. <laughs> Minty Whitaker said. Aside. She'll be down the aisle in a matter of hours. Oh. I've worried about that ungainly thing since the day she was born, Whit replied. Remember how she used to preen for us on the floor? So awkward. And with that lisp, how many times I thought to myself, she literally looks like something we found in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> well, that worked because you, you just, <laughs> so you've just read a bunch of labels about how perfect Kitty was. When you give upon that, that's the first interruption to the text, and you've just read all about her, her kind of minor flaws and her little eccentricities, but how perfect she is. And then you get to that, and it's like, well, something is awry. <laughs> So that's very well chosen because I do think that idea, and they're so relieved they've got her married um, to Bucky, the mining pharaoh of Pittsburgh. Um, and so there is this sense that, you know, Bucky's family needs, it's a very well told story. I mean, it's very Edith Wharton. It's a, you know, it's a family that needs a leg up because, you know, Minty's family came over on the Mayflower. Right. And so there's those dynamics going on. And, you know, I also wanted... Kitty has multiple marriages, and that's predictable, but, um, and that's sort of her being moved from collection to collection. Mm. But I also wanted her to kind of have one great love that she didn't understand mm -hmm. um, when it was happening to her. She was too young, and it was more about being acquired than it was about allowing those emotions to happen. And so I think that um, I loved kind of keeping that thread throughout the text that... that what was there at the beginning it becomes something very fundamental. And the idea that she is continually um, put in the position of being a one-woman show, um, that title has kind of two meanings. It is about one woman, this show, but it is also that she is constantly required to um, assert herself as a one-woman show because she experiences a lot of loss. Yeah. Um, I think we should read uh, probably the the label that stretches the form to its greatest capacity. Um, 
And this is one of the few, I should say, first of all, I didn't set out to write a book about this woman <laughs> at all. I made my first attempt to write a label about a person by describing a woman standing in the Mets galleries, a very typical woman. She's this kind of patrician Park Avenue lady. I called her Kitty. I had no particular investment in her as a character, um, but it worked. And that label is still in the book. It's just sort of three quarters of the way in. Um, but once I did it, I was like, oh, look at that. Now I'm gonna write, I'm gonna try and write 20 labels about that person. And let's just see if I can do it. So the attempt to just see if I could sustain the form caused Kitty to kind of take over the book. Mm -hmm. um, and so I never mapped out what was going to happen to Kitty. I never wrote in a linear way. I had that one label. Um, I think in this book, it, it's where she's 91 years old. Um, I had the last label, which I wrote probably, that was the third label I wrote, which is the last label in the book. And then I just kind of populated, I write on the wall, I write, a, like I would write a label and then tape it up onto the wall. And so I just kind of, the story spread like an ink blot. like I just let it happen. And then I'd have to figure out, like it, I loved the idea um, at the Met during World War II, um, all the important objects were put into storage at this, in this house in Pennsylvania. And I loved the idea of Kitty going to storage. And so, I just wanted to work that out. And so I just made the, the math work with her age so that she would go into storage at that time and what would happen. And then I just filled in how to make these things um, work logistically and narratively, um, but it was never a kind of clear path. So Kitty was sort of always revealing herself to me in a way, and I was always challenging myself, like, I wonder if I can write a label about that. And so this is one of those instances where I think, um, I don't, I think I pushed it to its farthest limit, but I also um, was particularly struck that I wrote this one in one go um, and never touched it again. Because um, a lot of times some of these labels would take four or five days to write and that's not particularly productive for a novelist to get 75 words out of five days worth of work. But, um, but once in a while, lightning would strike, and I'd um, write something that I have really felt didn't need to be touched. Mother, age 21, 1928. Mrs. William Wallingford III, known as Kitty. Collection of William Wallingford III. Ex-collection of Martha and Harrison Whitaker. With stopwatch precision, a Baroque swell of fertility secures Kitty's place as a traditional vessel. But studio malfunctions propel the glossy pink snuff box through Kitty as if she were constructed of lace. The baby survives for the sole beat of Kitty's whispered, possessive greeting, mine, before vanishing like an erased line. Kitty's blue period begins. Like a faint fissure from within, the clutching memory of those few seconds will break Kitty below the surface, a persistent interruption beneath her varnish. That was such a sad label. It is a sad label. I, th I think it's I a, it's a, um, it's the, the language at its greatest capacity. I think it is um, a sad label. But I also think it shows how you know, I use the language of porcelain for Kitty because it's so human in some ways and particularly suits her personality. It's hard but fragile. It's made of fire. It's easily moved around and put with other pieces of porcelain. Um, it has limited utility. Um, and it's really hard to hide its damage. And I think what, you know, in museums we uh, talk about Objects, when they have flaws, we say they have condition issues. And I think that's the most human kind of term. Like, what are we more than like a collection of condition issues? And I love the idea of how that kind of terminology and, um, and the, the language of porcelain and the, the varnish we um, present to the world and cracks beneath it um, really suit the human experience. Right. And she can function again, but there is but there is a condition. Right. And that's it, right?
Yeah, and I also, what I thought that was so poignant about when I got to that page, um, and I remember pausing, because Kitty became more human to me on that page mm -hmm. than she had been before that. And it's an interesting circumstance for me when I was reading it. I thought to myself, you know, maybe if I met Kitty in, uh, at a, you know, at a, at a party or at uh, in a gallery or something, I might not have been personally drawn to her. And there's a lot of things where you say, mm, you know, that's maybe not who I would have chosen as my, my best friend. But then you realize you start, as you go along, you realize that Kitty is worth rooting for. That yeah, you, you, she's not very likable, but right. you do root for her. That's it, yeah. yeah. So she's kind of a pain in the ass. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I find so. Oh, I was she fun. was a lot to live with for a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so that so like, roommate. Yeah. yeah. So it's an interesting conflict where you say, you know, I don't know if I if I agree, I certainly didn't agree with her machinations and how she moves through um, the universe. It's the universe she knew. Yeah. Um, and well, and I think it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, there's a lot of labels about Kitty when she's young, and one of the things that I did in the text is there's a kind of funneling of the number of labels as Kitty gets older and the world is losing interest in her. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a commentary on sort of taste and we have a great taste for the young and beautiful and full of potential version of Kitty. And then as she ages, uh, the world starts to kind of not care about her as much, not be as interested. Um, and so I skip whole decades um, because that represented to me um, the experience she was having in kind of navigating the world. Do, uh, do you want to read uh, an excerpt from one of those? Well, I'm going to read Kitty at the height of her power before okay, we yes. get to oh, her. At her yeah. um, this is Kitty, like, in full force. Bullfighter. Age 44, 1950. Mrs. Louise de Braganza. One of the things that's really interesting in using a line that is solely devoted to Kitty's name is how radically women's names change based on who they marry. And we know this, but as you watch her kind of um, marry and, and she accumulates this ridiculous name and then you turn the page, she's, now she's got a new husband and like that whole name goes away and she gets a completely new name. And that idea of defining yourself um, in connection with that collector, right. um, was really effective. I didn't predict that as much as, it, as I saw it happening on the page, how that one line in the tombstone information became so effective in defining her at any moment. Mrs. Louise de Braganza, known as Kitty. Collection of Luis Carlos Alfonso Antonio de Braganza. Ex-collection of Martha and Harrison Whitaker and William Wallingford III. Traveling exhibition. Rejecting the vernacular during a visit to London, Kitty champions the canon in a discreet assignation with Picasso during the second of his two trips to England. The artist's legendary appetites are no match for Kitty in full force. She seduces with industry and abandon, replacing traditional modes of expression with robust techniques based on curvilinear forms. Picasso, awed by the stark and savage edges beneath Kitty's gilding, handles her as if she were made of bronze. That's a sexy label. <laughs> she's a long way from Miss Porter's in that she's moment. She's a long way from Miss Porter's. She's, um, you know, and that's really transgressive. I mean, the thing about Kitty that I think was interesting as I was writing about her, and I know it sounds hokey when writers say this, but um, it does happen. She does start to kind of present herself and do things like that. And that's part me saying, like, what if Kitty sleeps with Picasso? Like, let me try and write that and see if that's possible. But also, like, the, the stealing thing became more persistent, um, and I think that was about... Um, almost demonstrating that Kitty understands what it means to be collected, mm -hmm. what it means to be like in someone's possession, mm -hmm. and so her own ability, very small, kind of petty theft, these kind of constant grabs at m mm -hmm. minor moments of power, mm -hmm. I thought were apparent to show that Kitty knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. Like she's, she's very smart. Um, she's very limited, but she's very smart. And I think, you know, a lot of people ask whether Kitty was based on someone real. I think we knew a lot of women like this um, at the museum, and I liked them. There were 
clever and interesting, and they they had a certain degree of power, um, but then they were they they lived in this kind of circumscribed way. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think Kitty, as a character, um, wanted to be a CEO. You know, I don't right. think that was her path. But um, and when you look at the the garniture, you know, those four women only appear twice. They appear at her wedding and their bridesmaids, and then we revisit them in the 60s. Yes. And what a path we have traversed in those years. So we've yes. gone from the 20s to the 60s. And what's interesting is, with each one of their lives and summing them up, you can actually see the entire unfolding of their lives um, and where we are, even as a society, um, based on where they are as human beings. Absolutely. And I think that was really... Um, interesting to understand that I didn't have to explain anything more. Um, that surprised me. Well, and I think uh, you uh, as readers will all see that years, of course, as you mentioned, decades pass and they've all lived their lives. The garniture has all gone off the shelf. Um, but uh, decades later, they, they still remember certain things. Yeah. Many and then they're, they're still, when they get together for, um, one of the bridesmaids is called Whippy. Um, they get together for Whippy's funeral. That's not giving anything away. Um, but, and they're still competitive. Yeah. And I think that that's true. I think when you're so hard, hardwired as a child to be that way with a certain group of people, they don't let go of that. Right, they didn't let and go. And so that's still like, they're all like around the casket and they're still kind of <laughs> sussing each other out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At 85. Yeah. So as you said, you, then we, we keep, uh, moving through, um, we keep through moving through Kitty's life, and now yeah. we know that she's uh, she's been acquired. She's been she's been accessioned. She's been deaccessioned. She uh, has. She's uh, had a reattribution. Yes, yeah, she's had a reattribution. That's right. She's, yeah, yeah. She's, and again, and so modern. Quite a I mean, how many report. people have gone on to Twenty Three and Me and found out the provenance was a little different than they thought? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of um, reattribution going on yeah. these days. Yes, that's, yeah. that's a really good point. So, um, where do you want to take us now in the story? Where Where do we land? What decade are we? Well, I think um, one of my another favorite uh, is. An event that happened at the Metropolitan Museum. It was our centennial ball in 1970. And um, Gary Winogrand, the great photographer, took these incredible photographs of that night. And this is 1970s New York, so you've got all those tropes that you can imagine, like men with their shirts unbuttoned and women in miniskirts and all this crazy um, kind of louche behavior. And then in those photographs, sort of off to the side or in the background are those women with their kind of helmet hair and their jewels and their taffeta gowns still you know, functioning within that same world that they have always occupied. But now there's this kind of tension between these intruders. Yeah. And, and I think Kitty at that point um, is representing that old guard, and she is very much um, in that mix. Party guest, age 64, 1970. Caroline Margaret Brooks Whitaker Wallingford de Braganza Dean, known as Kitty. Ex-collection of Martha and Harrison Whitaker, William Wallingford III, Luis Carlos Alfonso Antonio de Braganza, and George Robert Hoppington Dean. Kitty is on display at the Metropolitan Museum of Art's Centennial Ball. Her conventional profile stands in contrast to more contemporary forms, ripe and youthful with their rippling hair and snug gowns. The scent of late modernist pot in the Great Hall reinforces these stylistic differences as Kitty clutches her gin and prepares to dodge Buzzy McClure, a capacious tureen of a man known for his roving finial. <laughs> now that is a great example where I don't think you need to have you know the art history term finial to know what I mean <laughs> I think if I use the language the right way I love the sound of words I like the shape of words and I think if they're used the right way you don't have to explain it the cadence of it the 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 work of the words and the work of the... In that way, I think it's almost more like poetry, these labels. 
the constraint of it yields a certain um, voice and rhythm to it um, that should land because of the the sound and the the way in which the the patter works so that you know the meaning yes we know, we know that finial is somewhere it, it should not be <laughs> So you've taken us on this arc, um, and again, when, because it's a book talk, we don't want, we, we're not going to come to the end and give you every, how, how exact, how it ends exactly. That's, that's not uh, what we want to do. Um, but you can, you, I think we've gone now through an arc, right? We, and, and we've used this incredible structure that so many of us have encountered. Um, again, use, even just going back to that idea of the tombstone, um, which, for those who are new to working in museums, sometimes they're really surprised if they, especially if you haven't come to it from maybe an art history um, training, right? And you say, when someone says, can you check the tombstone? Um, that's it's really a dark term. It's a dark term. <laughs> especially but it when makes sense. It I mean, does. it does. I mean, I think um, so much of what we're doing in this book, I think, I don't know. I mean, to me, to have great joy and great darkness side by side is the most human kind of storytelling. And that, that's, that's humanity. That's why I, I, never, I never kind of take on all the seriousness and weight without balancing it with um, humor and that kind of levity and whimsy because I think that's how we function. That's how we survive. That's how we as human beings kind of navigate what we need to get through. And I, to, to me, those two things were operating simultaneously in the book um, it is what makes it easy to connect with. Yeah. Um, you, you, you need to feel that and why you understand Kitty. And, and I, I, want, I like that you don't really like her. I'm not sure you, I didn't want you to. Yeah. Um, and so that, that, but you don't d dislike her either because um, there are moments when you really do empathize with what she's going through. Um, you know, there's another label where she's with a curator from the Met and he's explaining to her what it's like to be really beautiful um, and that, you know, the, so many advantages to being really attractive. And she's like, excuse me, like, <laughs> do you know who I yes. am? And I think and that's the moment, it's a real turning point for her to recognize like, oh, I'm not in that game anymore. Um, and I think that's where she also, after that point, again, without giving things away, I think she releases a lot um, because she sort of recognizes that that thing that has defined her um, has again been lost mm -hmm. and that she is one woman show again. Yes. Yeah. So I'd like to always offer an opportunity or two for maybe just one or two questions. Sure. Does that sound good? And then maybe sure. we'll figure out how we would like to, how you'd like to leave it. I, I'm always conscious of not giving away the secret of the, yeah, end right? of the book. Yeah. Um, but I always oh, see a hand going up already. So um, would you like to ask the author a question? I would. <laughs> I, I just one thing I wanted to to say was the um, the label of of her tremendous loss that you read out loud that I was so impressed by the forward in, in such a brief but precise and moving label that the story pivoted yeah. and. <clears throat> Yeah. Shot forward with mm -hmm. really propulsive. Force. Yeah, yeah. I was really impressed by that. So just to, um, I'm glad to hear you say that. I think that that's. I think that word propulsion is really important to me because I think that that is is the way I want you to read it. Um, and I think it takes a while to get used to it. I mean, it takes at least five labels to realize. Well, I mean, I think in the beginning it took at least five labels to realize like she's not going to do anything else. <laughs> this is the whole book. Because I, I think in the beginning people thought it was just like a really clever framing device and like, when's the book going to start? <laughs> so, There's a lot of narrative, you know, interesting narrative strength in just that one label and, and how the story really changed. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a, a level of um, emotional engagement that, that attaches right there um, in a way that was really important um, in order for you to to work for the rest of the book. So I think. But I have a process question. Yeah. Um, 
and that is just out of curiosity. Did you write up to the label in terms of was your your process a, a, a narrow process that grew upward to the full label, or did you write above that seventy five word? Oh, like write a lot and then whittle it down? Down. Yeah. No. Just no. Curiosity. You got to go for it. Wow. Go for the 75 words right away. Because it's a, it's a form. It's a, you know, and I had written so many labels for the museum that, like, it is a, there is a form to it. There's a way that you link clauses and you jam in information. And so I would always try and write it. Um, I try and land 75. All I did was click word count constantly throughout this entire <laughs> writing process. So I think you try and get it 75 words right out of the gate, um, and then you have to um, whittle and structure and whatever. I mean, it's, it's hard to do. And I also um, would never give one up. I mean, a lot of people ask how many labels were left on the floor and how many made it to the wall. Like, I am relentless. Like, if, I just won't let go of it. So... Um, so getting to that 75 words, I would try and do it you know, right away, like I'd try and write it. Um, I think it's too hard to write a lot and then try and reduce it. Um, I, you know, I would always be delighted when I'd write one, even if it wasn't good, but I just got I stuck 75 words. When I hit word count, it was like 75. I'm like, God, look at me. Um, yeah, so I mean, again, I think it's a form, and I think it's a voice and a language, and... Um, it's a kind of, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a structural thing, um, how it works. But I think if you wrote lots of um, long sentences and then tried to condense them, um, it would show. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another question? Uh, uh, this woman in front, Judith? Um, I think your work is brilliant. Oh, and thank I you. enjoyed this discussion so much. My question is, I'm curious... What is your next project? <laughs> because uh, where do you go from here? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, similarly to this one, um, I have an idea that is impossible to do, and so that's the best kind of dilemma. Um, I had the idea for this book while I was writing the British um, labels, and um, I let it sit for two years. Before I, I don't like to take any notes. I don't like to write anything down um, until I start to write. Um, so I just let it cook and sort of sit in my head, and I go visit it from time to time. Um, so that's happening now with another bad idea. And so, um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm excited to see what happens. Um, yeah. Okay. Another question uh, there. Um, so, uh, being a label writer and traveling to other museums, was there a label that stopped your in your, in your tracks and you, you know, remember as being the, like one of the best labels in Bubba's piece. I think it's confession time and I don't read labels. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't like to read labels. Oh, I don't think you should read labels. I think you should look. I think you should spend a lot of time looking and I think you should, I think the best thing you can do at a museum is walk around and find something that makes you stop. And there's a reason it's making you stop. And so find that in you. Find, excavate that in a way that happens with looking. And looking is a muscle. And I think um, museum goers are not used to doing it. And they're not confident in doing it. They're very intimidated. But, you know, we don't ask people to read a 75-word description when they go to listen to a new piece of music. We just play the music, and you either like it or you don't like it, but you allow yourself to respond, and I think we should get more used to doing that with works of art, because there's a lot of joy and great pleasure in just the act of looking, um, and so I never read labels. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll take uh, one last question in the front. Um, I was curious to, uh, when it was asked you, is this book being translated into other languages? Because I think it would be very interesting for translators to... I know, it would be tricky. Um, at the moment, it was released in the UK at the same time, um, and now uh, it's 
possibly going to be in French and German. Oh. Um, mm. The Germans will have a field day, oh, right? <laughs> <laughs> they can make their own words. So. That's yeah. right. Yeah. 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 Good luck with the 75. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's how they're going to squeeze it in. They can just compound all the words. words. One last word. <laughs>